So if you have a question or a comment, raise your hand and someone will bring the mic to you. I'd appreciate it if you would wait until the mic gets here so everybody can hear you. Okay, we can begin. We have 35 minutes. First question is over here. So my question is going back to your discussion about the you may not be re-elected issue. And I'm seeing similarities with the push in Nebraska and other states to limit the number of the election. How do you see that as playing differently in the U.S. versus in Mexico? What should Americans be concerned about from your experience in Mexico? That's a tough question. In general, I think consecutive re-election is a good thing. Research has shown that term limits have negative effects at some point. In the case of Mexico, it was the only way to find a compromise that there would be consecutive re-election. So people took what they could get. The kind of negative effect that you usually can find with term limits is the fact that you can potentially limit the quality of the legislatures over time. Because yes, time and experience makes for better season legislators. It also brings incentives for what happens on the last term. Once you know you cannot run for that office again, are you really going to be fulfilling your duties properly or not? Are you going to be worried about the next steps? What are you going to be doing? Now, of course, there's arguments against it. Part of that is like, especially, and I'm reluctant to say this, but when it's so money driven, there might be a problem that certain money from certain corporations can infuse the process and have just voices, ad hoc voices, ad hoc voices, ad infinitum. That gets troublesome for me. I don't know if there's a recipe for it. I'm just going to say what I have said often to my undergrad students. I hope that the United States students, as generations go on, realize how blessed, how privileged this country was to have a first president, George Washington. General as he was, backed up by everybody as he was, he stepped down from power willingly. The Constitution didn't ask him to do it. It's a time where there were no term limits, a thing that eventually got tested in the early 20th century. But it set a precedent. And I think, though, that example should remain to newer generations of politicians that even if you can do it, there might be a time when you willfully should say, it's been enough. A new generation should take over. I don't know if it should be written in the law as much as in the hearts of politicians, but I know too well that that might be harder actually to accomplish. So, yes? When you were describing the study that you and your colleagues did after the 2018 election to measure how people responded to the political climate, you were measuring three, you were asking them three different questions. One, I think, was accountability. The other was the checks and balances. And then you also had professionalism of political figures. How did you define professionalism? How did they understand professionalism? Well, this is going to sound like a cop-out kind of answer, but we do not. We do not define that. 
And the reason for that is because sometimes when you're measuring public opinion, it gets tricky how much you want to prime them. You want to get a true sense of how they feel about something without inducing them to feel it in the moment. And at the same time, regardless of what they think, what a more professional Congress would look like, it is important to us for us to know that it, the mere fact that they see the possibility of a more professional Congress being a good thing, and that increasing the odds of them wanting to have uh, consecutive terms of election, that, that's the part that matters to us. Um, if we were to be policy makers or join forces with policy makers, then we definitely would want to know, then we definitely would want to unpack what do they mean specifically by professionalization, right? Um, and the last part, which is the most cop out of them all, mm -hmm. we have very limited budgets. And also, when it comes to surveys, we need to be cognizant that, like if, if I stop you in the street and I say, do you have 10 minutes for me to answer a survey? You may want to say yes if it's 10 minutes. If I start going over those 10 minutes, 11 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour, response rates drop very quickly. So there's two big, big constraints we have as researchers when it comes to public opinion. One, money to poll people. Uh, and you know we need to convince people that spending money on these sort of issues is important and, you know, there's other things that are probably more pressing. I understand. But some of these things are important too. So getting the money is one issue. But then once you get the money, how to allocate the resource of time to make your <coughs> interviews precise enough to get at what you want to get without priming the, ans the answers on them and also without making them more likely just to drop the study altogether. Does that make sense? But what were you hoping to measure? What we were hoping to measure is that um, when you have, ex the experience shows that nine out of ten Congress people in Mexico never run for Congress again. So, this, like they can they can run if they skip one term. But the statistics have shown that under this rule, only ten percent become professional legislators. Say that they're federal deputies right now, then they may become senators. They may go to something else, and they may, may come back. That's a terrible statistic, because you have a bunch of people that are there just for three years or six years, and they're there not caring about that post, but caring about where to go next. That's the kind of people that are going to be probably unlikely to become professionally embedded in, in their job and invested in their jobs. So what we were trying to get at, like, would you care about this if these people were to learn their jobs a little bit better? If they could literally know what they're doing better. <laughs> so, thanks. I'd, I'd like to ask you about the relation of the government to all of the drug trade and the cartels and the relation of the cartels to our country. What is the government doing uh, look, I, um, that's a, that's a tough question. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about the, the recent administration. And for reasons that I share with you, just so I don't, you know, I don't show my own personal bias, uh, I, can, I can tell you one thing. Uh, this is how difficult it gets to fight the drug cartels. Uh, President Calderon, who was president from 2006 to 2012, from the National Action Party, the one that followed Vicente Fox. He declared war on the organized crime in Mexico. He literally declared war on organized crime. And de depending upon whom you ask, the total amount, the total count comes up to anywhere between 60, 70,000 to 100,000 deaths in his administration of six years. Some of those are traffickers, some of those are criminals, some of those are police officers, some of those are uh, military forces, some of those are civilians. 
it's a really high cash flow deep count. Uh, did he have the best intentions? I personally think so. Uh, was he able to make a dent on the cartels? Probably not much. And uh, he, he and his administration paid a very high cost. Because then you also run into issues of human rights, especially for civilians. Um, so what are they doing right now? I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a quick parenthesis here. Um, my family has two teenage children, uh, most wonderful things, and we just had a baby brother for them in December. I don't follow, I haven't followed the news that closely over the past three or four months. So <laughs> what are they doing right now? I'm not sure and I don't, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, what I can tell you is, historically speaking, before President Calderon, usually presidents chose a drug cartel to go after. And I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but another one grew during that administration. So they went after one, the United States government was happy, usually there was a big apprehension, and another one, like, usually they went after the one, like, say, in the Gulf route, and then the one in the Pacific route grew. Or they went after the one in the Pacific route, and then the one in the Gulf route grew. Um, what President Calderon did differently is he went after everybody. And the retaliation was <coughs> tough. Um, fighting drug cartels is a really tough business, and for whatever my opinion is worth, that's a battle that's going to be lost every time you go against the market. With big a market as the United States is, you may fight it in Mexico, you may control it in Mexico, somebody else is going to supply it. I don't know who, but somebody else is going to supply that. Black markets with those kind of profits, they're not going to go away. So. Um, you haven't talked about this, but I'm curious, uh, policy of indigenismo, um, does that factor into that history as you put it together in any significant way in terms of its relationship to democratization, uh, people's opinions, etc.? I mean, I know down in Chiapas, it's, it's a very real history, but yeah. generally. Um, it's not my area of expertise. That's why I try to stay like, I don't touch on it because I prefer the experts to talk about it. And actually, you're going to get a whole talk next week on, on that. Historically speaking, it is true that, sadly enough, I mean, Mexico is not an exception, that indigenous peoples got the really wrong end of the deal. Um, you know, uh, there, there's no other way to say it. Uh, and in the case of Mexico, probably became a little more difficult to talk about because of the official discourse. Uh, the official discourse that eliminated race and ethnicity from <coughs> public dialogue. The way they did it was like by kind of like having this official history of a mestizo race, uh, that we all are mestizos, that we all are a hybrid. Uh, and the truth is, uh, at least my experience was that some people seem to be more equal than others. Um, yeah, and, and it's sad. It's, it's sad as it gets. It, it, it becomes evident a little bit with experience. And there's not a lot of, there's really not a lot of studies, uh, academic anyways, uh, tending to that. Much deserved attention, uh, overdue. And I hope that little by little, uh, this issue gets more, more and more the attention it deserves. It's not that there's no people working on it, uh, but even on the ground, but yeah, that, that's just just a tough, tough uh, goal for the indigenous peoples. I'll just see the reason I ask is <coughs> it would seem like that a country to take such a public step as they did in developing indigenous as a, as a program, as an official action, would seem to mean that there's a general sense of democracy that's behind it. and why doesn't that capitalize on other things? 
Yeah, I'm not sure why that's the case. Also part of the official discourse in the mid-1800s, there was a president that's still the official history accounts. He was the first indigenous president of Mexico, Benito Juarez. And this is the 1800s, right? So by all accounts, super progressive story, you can tell the whole world. But he also was an indigenous person that believed in certain liberal ideas. And this is confusing to you, my fellow Americans, because in the United States, liberal means left. Just about in the rest of the world, liberal means right, as in limited government. But anyways, that's another thing. That's for another day. And he had some liberal leanings. He was a part of the liberal party. And I'm not sure he himself would have had the kind of inclusive views that you would like to see. But again, I know I'm committing heresy here when it comes to Mexican politics. So I probably should stop myself there. Go ahead. Yeah. You mentioned people migrating north to the United States being a loss of political capital. For people who return to Mexico, whether they're deported or choose to return, can you tell in your research if they have positive or negative or any effect on democratization or your topic? The reason I started smiling, that's an excellent question. There's some people that are starting to work on it. It's hard to study because of the sample size. I have a little bit of data that I just started analyzing. So I don't have a definitive answer yet. Anecdotally, if you ever want to, and this I highly recommend, there's a beautiful documentary called The Other Side of Immigration. I can pass the reference to the organizers. And I mean, seriously, like if you guys ever want to organize a viewing of that documentary here, I have, I mean, I have the documentary. I have, you know, showed it to multiple cohorts and classes at UNL. It makes a difference for people to see that. And what I can tell you is that I think there's going to be a bimodal response. For some people, it's going to be like, yeah, I learned some things. I'm fired up. I'm back. And for some other people, it's going to be like, I didn't count much here. I went there and I didn't count much there. So it's going to be like, just like a suppression effect. I think those effects might be canceling each other. What I don't know is which kind of individual is responding in different ways. So there's a lot to come, but that's a different study that I'm just embarking on. Can you even say what percent of the population of Mexico people who return are? Top of my head from surveys on a national sample, I believe it was about 4%. So not huge, but enough to make a dent. As a political scientist, I would be very interested in your observations. Your observations, why it appears to have been so much harder for the country south of the Rio Grande to evolve a stable, successful political system than it was the two countries north of the Rio Grande. Is it cultural? Is it resources? I mean, I was just curious what you thought might be. I'm willing to say I don't think it's cultural. I mean, I know some people would really like that explanation. I don't think so. I think there's a number of really interesting, if you allow me to say, like these accidents of history that happened along the way. For one, Washington was certainly one for the United States. Civil war could have gone very differently, and it didn't. We got an Abraham Lincoln, you know? There's moments here and there that things look funny. So during the Mexican-American War, and this one, I actually, I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this one, because 
I'm highly unpopular in Mexico with this, and I'm highly unpopular in the United States, so it doesn't matter where I stay. <laughs> Hopefully you don't kick me out of it. You know? <laughs> See, the, you know, I was unpopular there because I, as I grew in my studies, I was never of the opinion that, like some folks grow up there and think in the United States stole more than half of the territory in Mexico. I don't see it that way. So just to say that out loud makes you very unpopular, you know, like it really does. Um, doesn't matter to me, I still think it's not the case. What I think was really difficult for Mexico at the time, Mexico was fighting the 1800s with a, you know, when you guys were about to big, you know, fight the big fight about slavery, Mexico's not fighting about slavery. There's, there's two main things going on. One was, what's going to be the role of the church? Because the original constitution of Mexico, which, by the way, was in, like Mexico, right after independence, they went for the whole enchilada. They didn't go federalist. They went like Alexander Hamilton, not just king, emperor. Uh, I mean, that's the first two years of history in Mexico. And then in 1824, they get a federalist constitution that is sort of resemblant in a way of the, of the uh, American constitution. Not exactly like that, but kind of emulating a few things. One of which was that the loser of the election was by president, <laughs> which we wisely eventually amended. Mexico didn't. And some of these wise politicians in the you know 19th century Mexico read this as like, um, hey, wait a second, in the absence of the president, I become president. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about who caused that absence. <laughs> <laughs> so they, there were a lot of uh, moments where people right underneath power seized power. That didn't happen here partly because of accidents of history, partly because we modified our institutions just to be time. Um, I am more willing to think there has something to do with those moments, those key moments and those key actors. Um, in the side of Mexico, the Mexican-American war, terrible, terrible president, General Antonio Lopez de Santana. I mean, I mean, if I say this in Texas, people are gonna cheer because that's a guy that slaughtered the Alamo. Also, that's the same guy that was so proud that right, right after slaughtering the Alamo, took a nap. Well, not right after, but you know, a little after the fact. That's how he gets caught. <coughs> Most people don't realize that. The guy was so big into his head. Mm -hmm. He goes on to like, I defeated them, and he takes a nap. And the US Army like catches up with him. He becomes prisoner, and of course, he was such a hero and such a nationalist that when pressed hard about signing those territories into the United States, he did it in exchange for his life. Like instead of dying a martyr and like, oh, oh why? And, and, you know, let's just do that. But here's what really bothers anybody that reads a little bit of history. Even after he did that, he still got elected president of Mexico. <laughs> that guy ran for office 11 different times, got elected as a equivalent of a leftist and a centrist and a rightist. It didn't matter. Like the guy just had a natural way to get to the electorate and be elected. Uh, and you know, that part I don't think it's culture. Um, if there's a little bit of political culture, and that's the one that worries me that I signal in the, uh, in the presentation would be about this worshiping of charismatic leaders as opposed to be key in, in, in holding off things in, in an institutional way. But I, I see with all and part of terror that that's an increased trend in the world. I personally don't like the cult of specific politicians. I'm a person of faith. And you know, I, I, I'm not shy about it. I testify about my faith every time I have a chance to. So to me, worshiping leaders that way, probably not a good thing for a nation. That, that's, that's my two cents.
but I want to stay culturally. Maybe a little bit of the political culture of charismatic leaders, but but not that's not the whole argument. Hope that answers. All right. Oh, well, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned the importance of freedom of the press in Mexico. How free is the press when so many journalists are in mortal fear? Um, there, there are so many killings of journalists. And so um, how free are they? I believe there's a lot more freedom of the press today than there ever was in Mexico. And there's no denying that. I, I think it's important for people to understand that those numbers that the indexes capture, they capture it for a reason. I think there's there's free press. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's it's risky business. It, it really is. But it's not just Mexico. Like it, it really is a risky business, especially nowadays. I mean, honestly, like you know, I'm sorry to say this, but just it, and honestly, any politician gets away with not being fact checked. They get away with the most outrageous claims. <laughs> Journalists have to fact check everything they say every time. Politicians don't. <laughs> it's it's a dangerous business for journalists everywhere just because they're at a disadvantage. They need to prove what they're saying and politicians don't. And to me that's kind of like I'm sorry, but that's kind of messed up. Uh, but I, I, I would want to hold politicians to the same standard we hold journalists when it comes to fact-checking their sources. Um, but mm, it, it, it's a tough thing. Here's one anecdote I can share with you. I was 21 years old, and I got hired by a national newspaper. Small one, but national. I was studying political science, and the director of the newspaper really liked the way I wrote. Um, it's funny because I wanted to write poetry, <laughs> and I wrote poetry, and he said, you know what, I think you have potential, but you're one of wasted in it, and like, I'm going to give you a shot, and we'll go from there, and this is a brief anecdote, I hope I'm wrong, but he literally, they called me, the editor called me one day, it was like 2 a.m., and said, your big shot will be tomorrow, you're going to go to this march, give us an account of that march in four pages. And if it's good, you're going to be hired. If it's not, you're done. And this at 2 a.m. and I had to be there at 5 a.m. and like I couldn't sleep. And I kept thinking, how can I write four pages about a march? Now, it went really well. I got hired. Here's an anecdote for you relating to what you said. And this is 1997. This is how I came to interview you know, Vicente Fox and even former president Miguel de la Madrid, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, I had a I had a, a person that worked in the newspaper that once came to me and said, very soon you will learn that there's some people you just don't write against. And be very careful, because the first warning they'll send is, even if you didn't share this with much people, they'll, they're going to find out what it is that you want the most in life. But they're also going to find out what's your worst fear. And they're going to let you know they know because they're going to send you a gift that's something you really, really wanted for a very long time. Maybe something you cannot even afford. But there might be a note that says, this time it was what you wanted the most. Next time it won't. So I think freedom of the press is free as it gets. But yes, of course, there's threats to it. And you know, sometimes people work under really difficult circumstances. And every time I, just the same, I salute our police forces here. And I say thank you for your service. When I meet a journalist, even here in the United States, I thank them for their service. That might be just me. Yes. I'm interested. Uh, the evolution of democracy. What about the edu the primary education systems between the two countries? Would that have anything to do with how you know our democracy has developed versus how Mexico has? Possible. Uh, it would be hard to test. One thing is important, and yes, there's uh, key educational differences. The United States graduates roughly three out of ten. 35 out of 100 people out of college. 
in mexico it's about that proportion is about eleven percent so eleven out of one hundred so it's a much less educated country people like myself with a college degree are rare even rarer from the kind of institution i came out from even rarer with a master's and a doctoral degree and because of the opportunities that i can find there i'm here i didn't come here thinking i'm going to stay in the united states that was never that was not my original intention life happened and things happened and i'm here and i'm happy i love this country i love this country uh make no mistake um but some people you know, like myself that are very needed there are no longer there just because there's a vicious cycle related to that uh, key difference. Also, just to pay that in, in perspective, people with uh, kind of like the equivalent of a college degree, sometimes they can make more money here washing dishes than doing what they can do with their college degrees back in Mexico. So it, it's, it's tough. Yes. Um, you mentioned this long-standing, uh, this long understanding of corruption in the Mexican government. Uh, what is the civilians' perception of that source of that corruption? Is it just the politicians or the parties trying to stay in power, or do the civilians think that there are other forces that they're fighting against too? Maybe it's the American government, maybe it's the cartels. What is the population's perception of that corruption? Um, I'm interested in asking a few questions, follow-up questions about corruption in studies coming up. Because of limited space, we haven't been able to ask those sort of questions, like specifically, what we know is this, thus far with the data we have. Uh, citizens see corruption widespread among government officials, but they also know that that's a way to, to get ahead that that's the currency they're going to have to pay sometimes to get ahead. Um, so they see corruption widespread as in, let's, let's grease the engine a little bit to our own benefit as well. And that part, that I would say there is a little bit of a culture of, you know, I, I have heard anecdotally, I have heard so many people tell me, hey, this government wasn't so bad. They didn't steal as much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, it, it really bothers me to the bone when I hear statements like that because I'm like, they should have not stolen anything. Like, like it's not if they stole little. It's, it's they should have never stolen a thing. Um, but so, some people have this kind of like, hey, if the economy does well, it's okay that they get away with whatever they get away with. And I, I know how this sounds nowadays. Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to make any political statement. I'm just saying in Mexico, I've heard that argument over and over. And it just shouldn't be that shouldn't be the case. Like like most Americans, uh, uh, we don't know or I don't know anything about Mexican history, especially to the south. Is, uh, how does Mexico get along with the countries in Central America and in the past? How they got? Um, I think there's a little bit of uh, by model. Like you know, there's always an official discourse where. You know, Mexico has been neutral in just about every international issue for the longest time. But I do think there's a little bit of a tension, especially with countries in Central America. And that has become more obvious with some migration patterns recently. Uh, I am conducting a study that we're really hoping to submit for revision very soon. Uh, Elizabeth Tice Morse, a very dear colleague at the University of I where we have tried to capture Mexican attitudes towards immigration to the United States, but also migration into Mexico from Central America. And part of what we show is that, at least for a while, uh, the attitudes of Mexicans when looking at migration from Central America didn't look much different than attitudes of Americans looking at migration from Mexico. We went there to try to cite a little bit of the scripture in the title and uh, with the measure you, uh, me with the staff you measure, you will be measured. Um, so. We have time for one more question. Oh. You had a question, right? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering uh, uh, what was the impact of NAFTA on, 
on uh, political and democratic. I, I know we've never entered an agreement where we thought we didn't get the best deal, so I wonder. So no, no. I, thanks for bringing it up. I'll, I'll be, I'll be a short side guy because I know you have to go, and we all want to go, and you know, I, I can talk forever, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> I get that all the time, and not in a good way. Uh, but here's the deal. Um, just the same way the American people resented parts of portions of NAFTA because of the loss of jobs, I'm, this is one thing that separates me from a lot of scholars. I try to be very objective, no matter what. And I can understand why people in this country are hurt by that and the loss of those jobs. What bothers me is that they've been misguided often as to the fact that some of these jobs just went to Mexico, for instance. It is true that some of those things went to Mexico. But what happened to Mexico, for instance, and people there will let you know, is agriculture got absolutely depleted. Depleted. And what that meant is that rural Mexico is in shambles. So, in order to get some of these unfair deals, you know, I mean, let's be honest, who gets the best deal? Whoever has the biggest stick. And let's not fool ourselves. The biggest stick in town and elsewhere in the world is ours, it's the American stick. Um, when it came to negotiating agriculture, <coughs> uh, Mexico. Corn is at the base of its, you know, diet, ancestrally, not just recently. And before and after, Mexico produced corn sufficiently for its population. Nowadays, a majority of the corn consumed in Mexico is American. And all of those rural communities that used to produce corn and other stuff are gone. And actually, ironically, <laughs> Some of those folks are the ones who are trying to come and work in the United States because their whole way of life is gone. So, you know, and this with this I want to close because this is why I don't make a lot of friends. I do understand the anger that's out there looking at migration coming from Mexico as a transnational trend. I understand that. I mean, I, I get it. Problem is. That's only one side and one part of the story. It's a very complex story. And no politician is willing to tell us the whole story. And when a voice like myself, I mean, really, who's going to pay attention to a professor from the University of Nebraska? I mean, I don't keep myself. I appreciate that you guys are you know, <laughs> taking the time. Uh, but the reality is NAFTA had a few really good things going through Mexico, that's for sure. But it's not the entire story. There were also areas which got devastated that eventually fueled some of the migration flows that you're still seeing today. Uh, and I'm pretty sure if you ask Canada, they'll say something similar. So maybe the biggest winners were the biggest corporations. Thank you very much.